Amen. Today we start a brand new book, the book of 1 Corinthians. And if I were to title this um, chapter here, I'd just call it Foolish Wisdom. Foolish Wisdom. And we're going to go verse by verse uh, over the next couple of weeks. We're going to cover 1 Corinthians as well as 2 Corinthians. But I really like the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians for specifically because it's very practical. Okay. Now you think you contrast it with a book like the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is just a very doctrinal book. I mean, it has a lot of what they would call systematic doctrine, right? Whereas Corinthians, though it has doctrine, it has a lot of practical tips that we can specifically relate to, that we can immediately apply to our church today. And you say, well, why is that? Well, simply for the fact that the church of Corinth had a lot of, had a lot of problems, okay? And throughout the years, our church... It's going to have problems, okay? We're not a perfect church. You know, we're not a, 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 a just once and for all perfect church with no problems. No, there's going to be issues that arise in our church sooner or later. It's just bound to happen. Why? Because the church is full of sinners, and sinners bring in problems. But the fact is, is that we need to deal with these problems. And I believe the book of First and Second Corinthians teach us that. Why? Because it shows us the way you're not supposed to do it. And then the way you're supposed to do it as well. So let me give you just a brief introduction. First and foremost, the, the, the book of 1 Corinthians is obviously written to the church at Corinth that's located south of Greece. Okay, It's next to Centria. It's in the region of Achaia. And so this is a church that's actually located where there's a lot of Greeks. There's a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, probably a lot of uh, 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 idolatry, okay? Simply because it's found in that region. But it's also the place where Paul met Aquila and Priscilla. Amen. Now, if you're on Sunday night, we talked about Aquila and Priscilla. And this is where he met them. This is where he found out that they were tent makers. And, and the reason they're there is because Aquila, according to the Bible, according to the book of Acts, was a Jew. And the Bible says that... Claudius, who was the ruler at Rome at that time, had dispersed all the Jews in all places. And so Aquila and Priscilla ended up at Corinth. And so that's one of the reasons I really like First and Second Corinthians. And really, if you listen to any type of preaching uh, in regards to the New Testament, more often than not, you'll hear a lot of references from the book of First and Second Corinthians. Yeah. There's a lot of doctrine that can be pulled out of here. And, you know, whether it's re in regards to the wisdom of this world, it talks about idolatry. Uh, it talks about a lot about um, it, it talks about a lot about the spiritual gifts and the misconceptions that people have of it. But it's also the, the popular book in which we find the template of how to discipline people in the church, how to excommunicate them from the church, according to First Corinthians chapter number five. And so we, we see a broad spectrum of topics that are covered in these books and we're going to go through each and every one of them throughout the next couple of weeks. But let's start here in verse number one. The Bible reads here, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So right off the bat, what do we see here? We see that Paul the apostle is writing to save people. Okay. Why is that? Well, we can simply see that by the fact that in verse number two, it says, with all that in every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anytime you see that phrase, to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in reference to someone who is saved. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Why? Because that's what you do to be saved. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It reiterates that in a different way in verse number 9 where it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So to verbalize that which you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead is signifying that that person is getting saved, right? And so here we see that that's what it's talking about. It's talking about people who have called upon the name of the Lord. But I want you to notice also that it says, called to be saints. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, you say, why would you focus on, on that? Well, according to the Bible, saved people are saints. Amen. Now, there, there's a false teaching out there taught, obviously, uh, by and large, by the Catholic institution. Yeah. And it teaches that the sainthood is reserved for those who have already died and who the Catholic Church would deem as being someone who has reached this just exceptional perfection of godliness, okay, or likeness of God. They, they, they have reached a certain degree of holiness, okay. You think of uh, Mother Teresa, for example, who if you probe her life at, at any extent, you see that she was not even a good Catholic, right? <laughs> I, uh, I remember I was, I, I was friends with a guy, and I was trying to witness to him when we had the church in Maywood, 
and and I was I was trying to witness to him. He wouldn't get saved, but he was like he was a staunch Catholic. I mean, he had the rosary around his neck, which is funny because they tell you never to wear the rosary around your neck in the Catholic Church. But even then, they're like, you know, the, this is it, you know. But he told me he goes he goes I got a funny story to tell you, brother Bruce. He said. I knew a friend, I had a friend who actually was the bodyguard, one of the bodyguards of Mother Teresa. I said, really? And he said, yeah. He was a bodyguard of Mother Teresa, and he said that Mother Teresa was a chain smoker. <laughs> she smoked like a chimney. And so every time, you know, she'd be doing her good deeds and all these things, she hit the corner and started smoking her pack of Marlboros. She could not stop smoking, you know, but yet they gave her the title of sainthood. Right. They gave her that she's in the likeness of God and that she has perfected this matter of holiness when she's a chain smoker. And by the way, there's far more worse sins than I'm sure that she's committed other than yeah. that. But the Catholic Church teaches this. And I'm not I mean, I don't care about slamming the Catholic Church, but I'm trying to I'm trying to contrast this to what the Bible says and what others are teaching out in this world. OK, you know, they'll teach that. When someone reaches a, an ecclesiastical recognition of someone based upon their works, that person is a saint. You know, Joan of Arc, or, or I don't know what the latest saint was, St. Paul of the, the, the Pope or whoever died. You know, what they do is they view that person's works after they die. And based upon those works, based upon their merits, they're given this title of being a saint. And by the way, once they become a saint, they basically become worthy of veneration, which is worship. Okay. And which the Bible would call it's idolatry is what it is. Okay. Now the, now, the Catholic Church refers to this as canonization, okay? The Orthodox Church refers to this as glorification. So they have more of a, a Christian bent to it, but it means the same exact thing. What they're doing is they're, 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 they're causing people to think that, yes, you have to work your way up to this title, okay? These people were not only good enough to go to heaven, but they're good enough to even receive the title of being a saint according to their standards. Now... Again, like I mentioned, what they do is after a person dies, they assess their works. And sometimes people don't even get the title of sainthood until like decades and decades afterwards. Okay, because they have to really want to make sure, you know, all the works that they did is worthy enough to, for this title of sainthood. Well, here's the problem with that. In Psalms 116, verse 15, the Bible says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So this is talking about someone who prior to death was what? A saint. And in the death of that saint, that became precious in the eyes of the Lord. You see, someone doesn't become a saint after they die. Right. Someone is a saint when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2. It's those who call upon the name of the Lord. And what the Catholic Church teaches is this, is the reason they deserve that title of being a saint is because of their works. They're, they're perfect. Their works are perfect. Well, here's another problem with that. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number four, they'll say, you know, this person deserves that title because they did perfect works. They're like, they're close to being perfect. Well, look what Ephesians 4.11 says. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, Amen. for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the Bible's telling us here the saints are not perfected as soon as they die. No, the saints are being perfected, right? They're being matured. They're being taught these things according to the word of God. So this whole doctrine of the sainthood of the Catholic Church is a fallacy. It's wrong. It's false doctrine. Okay. And really it gives people something to look to to say, man, I can never get to that point. You know, only these these holy people and these people who have done so many works and they travel to India and they're chain smokers. But you know what? They've done good works. These are the only people that get, get to heaven. No, the Bible says, look, if you've called upon the name of the Lord, you're a saint. Amen. And the reason he calls them a saint is because we're separated unto the Lord. Right. right. You know, we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, according to the Bible. You know, we've been separated. We've been taken out of this world. We're no longer the children of wrath. We're no longer the children of disobedience. The Bible says we're children of God. Okay, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. So there's a lot of doctrine even in, within those two verses. You know, calling upon the name of the Lord, being a saint. You know, even when we're missing the S, we're still saints. Amen. Even when we're ain't, we're still being a saint. We're still all a saint according to God. Because the fact is, is that God doesn't look at us through our righteousness when we're saved. Right. You know, when we're saved, the Bible says that God imputes his own righteousness. Jesus Christ imputes his righteousness into our account. Amen. So when God looks at us, he sees us through the blood of Christ. He sees us through the righteousness of Jesus and not through our own righteousness. You say, why is that? Because the Bible clearly tells us that we are all as an unclean thing and our righteousness are as filthy rags. They don't mean nothing in the eyes of God. 
Verse number three says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. So here we see in verse number five that because of Christ we're enriched. What does it mean to be enriched? It means basically to be enhanced. It's taken to another level, right? But it says there in what? In all utterance. Well, what does utterance mean? It means the ability to speak. Okay, you said, why would we need to be enriched in all utterance? Because the fact is, is once we get saved, we're not just like these polished soul winners, right. communicators of the, of the gospel. We're not like the best, you know, min, uh, ministers of reconciliation. Now, we know the gospel. Yeah. We know the death, burial, and resurrection. But you know what? Throughout the years, you need to become more polished in your soul winning, right? Amen. You need to sharpen your sword, learn a better illustration, maybe memorize the scriptures that you're using more often, learn what's the best terminology and phrases to use. What is that? That's being enriched in all utterance. Amen. You know, we want to be able to utter the gospel, open our mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Right. And look, though we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, doesn't mean you're like the best gospel preacher. Right. You know what I mean? We want to make sure that we're constantly sharpening that, sharpening that sword. We're constantly getting better at soul winning. We're constantly being enriched by Jesus Christ in all utterance. But it says there, and in all knowledge. So how do you grow in your utterance? How do you grow in your communication of, uh, of the gospel? You grow in knowledge. You know, once you, you know what the Bible says in the, in the book of Romans in regards to salvation, well, now it's time to move to the book of Ephesians to see what the Bible says there. Some verses you can use from Ephesians. What about Titus or even First and Second Corinthians or even John and Matthew and all these other areas that you can use, verses you can use or even in the Old Testament to be able to preach the gospel. You see, God doesn't want you as soon as you get saved. You're just like, well, you know, I'm good to go. You know, I don't need to learn anymore. No, you need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in order to grow in utterance. And look, we're not talking about you growing to become a pastor or a preacher. Okay, we're talking, about, we're talking about preaching the gospel here. And everyone, everyone needs to have within themselves a desire to say, I want to be a better gospel presenter, a better gospel preacher. I don't want to be satisfied. I don't want to think that I know it all. I could always learn something new, add something to my yeah. artillery. I want to go with someone new. Why? Because someone, every man is my teacher, right? right? Jack Howell said that. Every man is my teacher. I can learn a new illustration, a new way to present a new, uh, the, the gospel presentation. And so we need to grow in that area to be ready always to give an answer to every man, right? Yeah. The Bible says that the righteous addeth learning to his lips. He teaches to his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Uh, you're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 6, goes on to say, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we obviously know that that testimony is referring to the testimony that God gave of his son, right? Mm -hmm. That he sacrificed himself, that he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Mm -hmm. The Bible goes on to say in verse number 8, who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is that? That's basically, that's talking about, that's talking about eternal security right there. Amen. You know, God's going to confirm us unto the end. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we need to grow every single day, right? We need to be reading the Bible, cleaning up our lives, growing in grace and all these things. But we understand that there's going to come a time where the Bible says God's confirmed us all the way unto the end. We're going to go glorified at the end. Why? Because we're, the Bible says we're waiting to wit the redemption of our bodies. Okay. Now we need, to, we need to practice this thing of sanctification while we're here on this earth, but we have the promise of God. We have the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, Amen. unto the praise of His glory, the Bible says. And so the Bible teaches us that we've been purchased, right, with His blood, but we have the confidence, we have the understanding, we know that God has confirmed us all the way unto the end. And praise God for that. You know, and thank God that, that he not only gave us the plan of salvation in the sense of we just have to believe on Christ, but he tells us over and over and over again that it's once saved, always saved. Amen. Right. Amen. I had the privilege to go soul winning today, and we led two people to the Lord, both of them in Spanish. One was a Salvadorian guy. And man, it was just, it's one of those salvations that is just great when they just like catch it completely. They don't have a lot to overcome. Which is very rare for a person who is up there in age, because this guy was, you know, in his maybe his 70s, early six or late 60s, uh, early 70s, and you know, you kind of like judge the person right off the bat and say, man, I don't, this guy's set in his ways, you know. 
But I witnessed to him, and man, he was catching every single point. He got the plan of salvation. He understood eternal security. And it's just like, this is enjoyable. I like this, you know? And he gave all the right answers. You know, he understood it completely. And he understood the matter of it. He got eternal security wrong. And then I showed him from the Bible. And then he's like, okay, now I, now I get it. You can't lose your salvation. I said, do you believe that? He says, yeah, I believe that. You know, if the Bible says it, I believe it, he said. You know, it's one of those cherry on tops that God allows you to experience every once in a while. But thank God for all the verses in the Bible that teach eternal security. You know, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Verse number 10 says, Now I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Now, now he segues here. Okay. Now remember this, just as we were studying the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians, just remember this is that they had a lot of problems. Right. A lot of problems. Okay. And he's going to go through each and every one of these issues that this church had. Now, problem number one. He's already mentioned it in verse number 10. So he's like, growing utterance and knowledge. You, know, you guys are saints and God's confirmed you until the end and all these things. And he says, now look, you guys all need to speak the same thing though. Okay. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. So problem number one, right off the bat, what was the problem? They were having divisions. Yep. Okay. There were, there were strives, there was envyings, but the Bible says that there is division, there was conflict in the church. Verse 11, for it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, I like what he says here, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So the house of Chloe basically snitched on them. <laughs> He said, Paul, hey, man, there's these guys, man, they're causing all kinds of problems in the church. They're causing all kinds of divisions. And Paul wasn't even like, don't worry, man, I won't, tell, I won't say who it is who told me. He's like, the house of Chloe told me. So I know this is true, okay? Look, when you have divisions, there will always be contentions, okay? Now, there's four specific cliques within this division, because these are cliques that they're talking about here. You see, isn't the Bible great? Because... You read this and you're like, man, this happens today. Yeah, right. You know, clicks happen all the time in churches. Yeah. Okay, look at verse 12. It says, now this, now this I say that every one of you saith. So not one person in this church is not part of this division. Because it says every one of you are saying this. Yeah. I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanas. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So what he's saying, look, you guys are, some of you got a click, the Paul click. <laughs> then another one has the Apollos click. The other one has the Peter click. And then the, other, the, the fourth one is probably the one who has it the right, the, the best way is the Jesus click. <laughs> okay. Now what those three clicks they needed to do is join the Jesus click. That's what they need to do. Okay. But here's the problem. And we say, well, why is that causing the division? Because we're all part of Team Jesus anyways. Amen. So how can we put that? How can we apply that to modern day? It's like saying, well, you know, I'm of Steve Anderson. I don't know. Are you, are you Hike? I, I know you like Pastor Donnie Romero. So you're of Donnie Romero. You're of Jimenez. You're of Jason Robinson. You know? And like, well, we, I just like him better than... We're all Team Jesus. Amen. Okay. These are men through whom which we have believed, yeah. as we're going to see later on. These are great men of God that have planted, that have watered. But look, we don't have gangs in the church. Amen. We shouldn't have cliques and say, yeah, you know, Pastor Manners is good, but I'm, I'm all about Pastor. Whatever Pastor Anderson says goes. Or whatever Pastor Jimenez says goes. Or whatever Pastor Jason Robinson says goes. No, whatever Jesus says goes. Amen. Right? We ought to stick to what the Bible says about having unity with Jesus, right? Around Jesus. Yeah. So this is the problem here is that they're having this, this division and Paul's like, man, and look, it almost looks like it's based upon who was baptized by who, right? Because he says this, he says, uh, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's like, man, I thank God that I baptized none of you. But Crispus and Gaius, he goes, this could have been a lot worse. Yeah. If I would have baptized Crispus, Gaius, and these people, man, I could have, my clique could have been the biggest one here or something, you know? So it's based upon those who, who maybe uh, are, were baptizing. And then he says, and it's like almost as he had a relapse of memory. He goes, oh, and by the way, the house of Stephan is too. But other than that, I don't even know if I baptized anybody else. So what is he saying? We ought to never have that kind of division. Now, I want to divide, 
with false doctrine and false teachers. Amen. Okay? Even in independent, fundamental Baptist churches, right. yeah. I'll divide oh. with someone and some pastor who's teaching some false doctrine. Right. Okay? You can clear, you can put that line right there, and at that point you can say, well, I'm of Mejia. Okay? I'm a Mejian. I'm not what the Rodriguez is. I'm not with the Paradas. Yeah. I'm not with these false teachers. I'm not with these pastors and preachers. I'm with Pastor Anderson. I'm with Brother Bruce. I'm with whoever on this side of right doctrine. Okay? Yeah. That's different. All right? But the fact remains is that we, as a church, we're a team right here. You know, and this yeah. isn't taking place in the church or anything like that. But this is preventative, amen? Yeah. This is that preventative vitamin so that less you should do otherwise after this sermon. Okay? So, and by the way, you say, why are they dividing? Why is there division? Well, we'll see later on in chapter number three, he calls them what? Babes in Christ. Yeah. And then he says right after that, because they're babes, he because there's envies, there's strifes, and there's divisions. You see, only children in Christ, only babes in Christ, just fight about stupid stuff like that. Right. You know, someone who's mature in the Lord, you know what they're doing? They're focusing on soul winning. They want the work of the Lord to be done. They're excited when people come to church. They're focusing on the essentials and that which is most important. Okay, yeah. Only a babe in Christ it would, have, would focus on divisions according to chapter number 3. And that's what he's saying. So these are the kind of people that want to pin pastors against one another. You know, And they think that every single pastor needs to agree on every single thing. You know, well, look, that, we're not a denomination. Amen. You know, and it's funny that we want to rag on the denominations, but you're doing the exact same exact thing. You know, no, we're not a denomination. And it's good that we don't agree on everything so that we can never become a denomination. Right. It's good that Pastor Jimenez doesn't agree with everything that Pastor Anderson says and vice versa and with every other pastor. But you know what we do agree on is the most important doctrines. Yep. Amen. Okay. And look, we get the cherry on top because we agree on doctrines that are not even the most essential, like end times. You know, that's the cherry on top. You know, the replacement theology, that's the icing on the cake. That's good stuff. Because it's not doctrine, that it, that it's not damnable, right? But the fact that we can agree on those things that are not essential, that grows us even closer to one another. That's why our churches are tight-knit. You know what I mean? That's why I can go visit someone in the South who I've never met before. He's, he's white as light, you know? He's probably never even seen a Mexican in his whole life. But if he believes like me, we're going to get along pretty good. Amen. You know, why? Because we share the same doctrine. Yeah. You know, he hates homos, so do I. Amen. You know, he's a Jew inwardly, so am I. Amen. You know, he believes it's after the tribulation, so do I. So these are very important things that we, under we have to understand. We can't divide over small things, right? Yeah. We're all part of the same team, and that's Team Jesus. Now... Verse 17, go back to, oh, I don't know if you're in 1 Corinthians, if I, had to, if I had you turn somewhere else, go back to 1 Corinthians, chapter number 1. Verse 17 is a, is a verse that the church of Christ rejectors need to just memorize. Okay, they need to memorize it, they need to meditate upon it, they need to write it on their walls, you know, they need to contact Stephen B. Lettering and get a calligraphy sheet of, of this verse. <laughs> Uh, you know, KJV Honey, you know, they need to contact her and get that verse. They need to understand this thing, okay? Now, before we read that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul obviously explains, he says, Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. A necessity is laid upon me. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, we see the Apostle Paul making a very big deal about him and the necessity that is laid upon him to preach the gospel. Amen. I mean, he's like, I need to do this. This is something that's very important to the Apostle Paul, right? So with that in mind, let's read verse 17. Yep. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You say, well, why do I have to memorize that? Because the church of Christ rejectors uh -huh. believe that in order to be saved, aside from the fact that you have to repent of your sins, right. You have to live a clean life and all the list of other stupid things you have to do. You know, you have to be baptized uh -huh. in order to be saved. That's what they believe. Yeah. You know, these fools think that by bat getting baptized, you wash away all your sins. And, and by the way, they, these same people believe you could lose your salvation. So how many times have you been baptized then? <laughs> you know? But they believe that you have to be baptized. And they'll say this. The gospel is baptism. You know, when the Bible says that, you know, believe, that we have to believe in the gospel, it's referring to baptism because that's what saves you. 
Well, then you have, then you're, then you're dumb. Because 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Paul clearly just said this. Woe is unto me. Necessity is laid upon me. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, I didn't baptize any of you. I just baptized these guys right here. He goes, I'm glad. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I didn't baptize all of you. You know? And then he says in verse 17, Christ wanted me not to baptize. Yeah. So is he contradicting himself? No. Because he's making a contrast. He's saying, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to what? But to preach the gospel. Right. Right. Showing that baptism is not the gospel. Right. Ba the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Amen. Christ. Okay? So these Church of Christ rejectors, i.e. Caleb Robertson and his whole inbred family, okay, they need to understand that the Bible teaches us that you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. The Bible clearly teaches us here that there's a difference between the two. I, I mean, I, I want to know. If you have to be baptized to be saved and you could lose your salvation, so do you have like a monthly baptism? Right? How does that work? You see, the Bible tells us that God, once we get saved, washes away all our sins. Amen. You know? And, and the fact remains is that, you know, baptism is just a picture of salvation. Amen. Okay? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus right. Christ. But it says there, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And there's, there's a lot of applications that we can put to this, but clearly what he's saying there, well, let's read on. Oh, let me read it again. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What he's saying is this, is that when we use the wisdom of this world, or any kind of wisdom of words, right. we actually dilute and weaken the gospel. Right. You see, the gospel is something that's very simple. It's very plain. You know, it's something that a five-year-old can preach. Amen. It's not very complicated at all. It's just the death, burial, and resurrection. It's to just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. These are simple words. These are simple things that you have to do in order to be saved. But if you try to just add all this spiritual mumbo-jumbo, this theological wisdom to try to make yourself look smart, then guess what? You weaken and you dilute the gospel is what you do. Yeah. I, when, I, when I think of that, I think of the Calvinists. They do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, right? Because Calvinists are not interested in seeing people saved. They're interested in, in seeing people see them as being smart and intelligent. You know, because they know Greek and, you know, all these words and metanoia and all these other words. And so people could be like, wow, this guy knows like a whole lot, you know. And they like to impress people. You know why? Because they want people to glorify them. They want people to esteem them. Well, you know what the Bible says? That that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the eyes of God. Okay. So... We can't, don't use wisdom of words. Yeah, grow in your ability to preach the gospel, but you don't need the Greek, right, Amen. to be able to explain the gospel, Amen. right? You don't need to have all these theological terminologies in order to get the, convey the gospel. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. and thou shalt be saved. Very simple. Why? Because God loves us. Right. And if he loves us, he wants it to be easy. And because it's easy, it's easy to communicate, all right? Now, verse 18 We'll, we'll hit more on that in just a little bit. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So the Bible is telling us that the world sees the preaching of the gospel, it's foolish, right? I mean, I've had people tell me that all the time, that what I'm saying is stupid, what I believe is stupid. I remember one time um, at my old church, we used to have a day, and I'm sure you've heard, it's called Friend Day. And Friend Day was a day, was an evangelistic service where they would preach the gospel and, and people have been saved through that. You know, I don't, obviously I don't agree with having that, but there have been people that have been saved through those, through those services. Now, I had a, this is at a time when I wasn't working for the church and I was working at a, at a telemarketing company and I invited a lot of people to come to that church service. So they came and, and there's this one girl who was there and I remember I saw her in, in the auditorium and I didn't even get a chance to talk to her, but on Monday morning I went to her and I said, what'd you think? She goes, yeah, I, I liked it, it was pretty good. And then later on, I talked to her again. So I was like, so tell me, what, what did you think of the service? She goes, to be honest with you, I just think it was probably the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. I was like, oh, okay. You know, uh, why? You know, she's like, and she said, because that guy said that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he resurrected from the grave. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And then all we have to do is just believe on him to be saved. She's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. She said that. And I was just like, okay, all right. And then I just walked away like... <laughs> All right, she just rejected the gospel, you know. Yeah. Now, for a safe person, that was like shocking. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, how can you say that that's the stupidest thing you've ever heard? Yeah. But you know what? The Bible says it right there. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It's stupid to them. 
But we understand that it's the, it is the power of God, right? Amen. To us which are saved, it is the power of God. Why? Because the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Amen. Verse 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, go with me if you would to Isaiah chapter 29. This is where this is quoted from. Now, why do people think it's foolish? Because obviously they're esteeming their own wisdom, right? If you were to ask someone, what do you have to do in order to get to heaven? You know, many of the, the, the answers that, that people will give you is like, well, because I'm a good person. You know, the wisdom of this world teaches us to be good people, to do good works, to do good merits. And based upon those things, we can get to heaven. That's the wisdom of this world. Yeah. Okay. You know, for, for example, just yesterday, you know, on Instagram, there's, there's a lady that follows me on Instagram. Well, she stopped following me now, but she was following me on Instagram. And she actually followed me just a little after I preached my vegan sermon, if you guys remember that, on Romans chapter 14. Now, ironically, she never heard the sermon. She just liked one of my posts that, that I put about my family, and she just decided to follow me. But she's a full-blown vegan, all these things. And so I followed her back because I'm thinking to myself, well, she has hundreds of uh, thousands of followers. Hopefully my stuff will get into her, you know, followers, and then she, they'll end up seeing our, our stuff or whatever, and they'll listen to the sermons. So, but her stuff comes on my feed all the time. But I saw one of her feeds, and, and it had some weird design to it. And I was like, I'm going to read this. What is this? And then she was, it was like Buddha. Talk about Buddha and all this, this weird religion, you know, all this pagan stuff. But it, it, it's funny because it talked about Tutu, you know, from Africa. You guys remember that guy? Yeah, when Pastor Anderson went on that on the missions trip over there, and and yeah. I don't know, I remember what his first name is, but she talked about him and the book that he wrote and all these things, and how the way you can have everlasting happiness is by having peace with yourself, just the wisdom of this world. Right. And I couldn't help it. <laughs> and I just, I just, I responded. I said, the only way you can have everlasting life is through Jesus Christ. Amen. You know. And it's not through any of this, I said. And I said, I'm not trying to be contentious, but you followed me. Therefore, obviously, you opened up your feet to open scrutiny, you know. So this is what I'm putting. And, and I put that. And then she said, you know, I appreciate what you said. Obviously, I, you know, I don't agree or whatever. And she said, you should really try to read these books. And, and these books, they, they have a lot of insight and enlightenment. And, you know, Gandhi said this about being a, about being a Christian. And he says, even Gandhi said that he was a Christian. That's what she told me. And I quote her, I said, you know what Gandhi actually said? He said, he said, I would be a Christian were it not for Christians. And you know what he's insinuating is that being a Christian is based off of things that you do. Yep. Right? That's what he's saying. And I said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I said, Gandhi's not a Christian. Yep. And I said, and, and she even said that she was a Christian. Right? She's like, I'm actually a Christian, you know, but I respect all religions. Now, let me just go on and say that I don't respect any religion. Amen. Amen. And the only religion I respect is Christianity, yeah. the true Christianity, because there's only one true religion in this world. Right. Okay? And you can you know, say, oh, you're being dogmatic, you're being obsolete. Yeah, you're right, I am. Amen. Okay? Right. If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, come within, that's an absolute, absolute, uh, an ab absolute statement. That's ob yeah, right. not obsolete, sorry, ob absolute. I'm getting too yeah. confu <laughs> confused. That's an absolute statement yep. to say he's the only one. He's not saying, I'm the only way, but if you're in India, go ahead and follow Gandhi. Because <laughs> I understand you grew up that way. No. Exactly. No man right. cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. Okay, Amen. just believe it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, and I said, you know, and she has this thing that a lot of people have who have thousands of followers. They have this app or something that basically you follow people, and after a couple weeks, your, your phone automatically unfollows them. So they basically, that's how they... They get their, all their followers. So they can get a large following by people who, you know, they follow and then they get unfollowed. So it makes it look like they have this large following, but people don't even know that she basically unfollowed. And that's how it works. If you didn't catch that, ask me afterwards and I'll explain it a little, little more thoroughly. And I said, and I basically said, look, I'm not trying to fight with you. You just, your, your feed came on and this is just what I believe. I said, but you're not even following me, so it doesn't even matter, you know. And I unfollowed her. But you know what she's doing? She's quoting the words of man's wisdom. Yeah, yeah. And if you were to ask the average unsafe person, they probably agree with her. Because yeah, yeah. it's the world. It's going according to the course of this world. 
But you know what the Bible says there? God says, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of this world. He didn't say, I'm going to appease it, or I'm going to, yeah, you guys got a point. No, he said, I'm going to destroy it. And I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. These people who think they're so smart with their college degrees and their theological mumbo jumbo and all these things that they believe that they're, they're so high and elevated spiritually. No, God says, I'm going to bring to nothing your understanding. Okay, Isaiah 29 verse 13 says, Wherefore the Lord saith, For as much as this people draw near unto me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among the, this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. You know what he's saying there? He's saying what he's saying in the New Testament. I'm just going to destroy it. Amen. Okay. And you can make it sound as eloquent and beautiful as you want. Doesn't mean nothing to God. Right. He's going to destroy it all. You know, that's what the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise. Right. Yeah. What happens? They became fools. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why, you know, they think that knowledge is everything. Well, I believe knowledge of the Bible is everything. Amen. Right. Yeah. But what they're referring to is just the knowledge of this world. Right. Okay. But, the, but, you know, the Bible says they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Yeah. So you can learn as much as you want and get all kinds of enlightenment by Gandhi, Buddha, and all these other people who are burning in hell today. Amen. That's right. You know, I guarantee you, and you, both of those guys are regretting every single moment that they taught what they taught. Because they're burning in hell. They understand that, and they've led, they've led thousands, yea, millions to hell by their false doctrine. You know, he's destroying them. He's, just, he's destroying their own wisdom and their own prudence, so-called. Verse number 20, and uh, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I like verse number 20 because it's like, you know, you know when someone gets in a fight and they're looking for someone, they're like, where's that guy at? You know, they like, where's he at? Come at me, bro. You know, it's like, where you at? Well, this is what he's saying in verse 20. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? He says, where's the disputer of this world? What is he talking about? Where's the debater? Right? Because where does debating really come from? It, uh, well, where was it really popularized in, Greek, in Greece, right? Yeah, yeah. They love debating, philosophy and all these things. Well, there's a reason why the Paul, Paul the Apostle is quoting this in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Because why? That's probably prominent in that area. Yeah. And he's like, where's the disputer? Bring him over. Bring his wisdom. I'm going to destroy that wisdom. Right. Okay? So when I think of the wise and the scribes and, and the disputers of the world, I often think of these Christian debaters, so-called, right. yeah. okay, who, you know, they like to use archaeology and history to prove the Bible and all these, these, these stupid methods of, of proving God, you know. Um, I can't think of any of them right now, but these, most of these guys don't even say it, first and foremost, okay. Right. But a lot of people flock to these teachers because they just sound very wise, right? They're the, they're are, they are the disputers of this world. God says, I don't want to dispute nothing. Right. You know, I'm going to bring to naught, you know, these things. And he, by the way, later on, we're going to see how he's going to bring them to naught. Okay. He's going to bring them to naught by those which are not. Amen. Okay. And we'll, we'll get into that just a little bit. But these are people who try to, you know, win people by cunningly devise arguments and stuff like that. And, and they try to sound very smart on YouTube. And, and they, yeah, you can't use the Romans road. You know, you can't use the Romans road when you're trying to win people to Christ. You know, if you go to, you know, Southeast Asia or India or any of the, one of these areas, you can't just win people to Christ by giving them the Romans road. No, you need to, you need to start in Genesis. You know, you need to prove their religion wrong. You know, you got to spend six months witnessing to someone. What? You know, that sounds like the wisdom of this world Amen. is what it sounds like. You know, yeah, I wouldn't pray with them if I were you because you don't really. No, you know what? You're using the wisdom of this world is what you're using. You know, the way that God has set forth to be saved is simple and it works for everyone. It's a one size fits all salvation. It works for everyone. Okay. Verse 21 says, for after that in the wisdom of God... The world by wisdom knew not God. So what is he saying? Wisdom can't save anybody. Yep. So you can, you can memorize a whole thesaurus for all I care. <laughs> you know, quote the whole thesaurus as you're witnessing to someone. But you know what? The wisdom of this world, or the, the world by wisdom knew not God. Yep. You can't understand God through the wisdom of this world. Right. Okay? You know, trying to prove it through creation science. Trying to get saved through, through the creation. You know, by the way, 
I, I'm thankful for creation, and we obviously understand that we understand that there's a creator based upon creation, but that doesn't save anybody. Right. I've heard people say, you know, people could get saved by looking at the stars. Yeah, no. What the heck? <laughs> Unless the stars are spelling out the Romans Road and someone's there reading it to you, they're not getting saved. Amen. Okay? And so these things don't save anybody. The Bible tells us there that for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, mind you, Paul the Apostle is being facetious here. He doesn't think preaching is foolish. Yeah. He's using their terminology to say, you know, how they think preaching is foolish. He's like, all right, well, God's using this foolish preaching right. to save them that believe. Amen. Okay. This guy who's getting up here and just ripping and slobbers coming out of his mouth and he's kicking the pulpit and he believes that it's one saved, always saved. You know, people are getting saved through those things. Amen. Okay? Because that's what he has chosen. He hasn't chosen the wisdom of this world. He's chosen his own wisdom Amen. to see people saved. Okay? So again, Paul is just slamming this thing of the, of the world's wisdom. Why? Because I believe that Corinth was in an area like that. And in, in chapter 2, we're going to see a lot of when he talks about you know, the words of man's wisdom. What happens when you use this world's wisdom? Well, people begin to, begin to put their faith in that wisdom yeah, yeah. rather than in the power of God. True. You know, they begin to put their faith in the fact that you know a lot. And, you know, a lot of these people who are in these Calvinist churches, they probably feel as stupid as the day is long. Yeah, yeah. Because their pastor makes them feel stupid because they're the only ones who can interpret the Greek or whatever. You know, and they're probably like, well, I, I guess I just got to, like, trust, you know, John MacArthur. You know, he knows, he knows everything. You know, I just got to buy his books and just, just learn from, just trust him. You know, he, he went to school for X amount of years. He knows the Greek, you know, um, what's that other heretic? I can't think of his name. James White. James White. Man, James White, he like does his devotions in Greek. <laughs> I struggle doing my devotions in English. He's doing his devotions in Greek. You know, these people probably feel real dumb, you know, but why is that? Because... They're trying to use wisdom to basically uplift themselves. Yeah. They're trying to, that's what the Bible says at the end of this chapter. It says, let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. Yeah. You know, but these people, they want to glorify themselves yeah. by showing off their smarts. Right. Okay. By putting their, 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 their intellect on the pedestal. Verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So here we see two groups of people here. Okay. And... Again, so now you see three ways of preaching the gospel. You have the Jews who seek a sign. You have the Greeks that seek wisdom. And then you have God who says, use the foolishness of preaching. Okay. Now, both of these groups got it wrong. Yeah. The Jews and the Greeks. You know, the Jews seek a sign. Well, you know what Jesus said? An evil and adulterous generation uh, seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be in the center of the earth, in the heart of the earth. So what does it say? It's talking about the gospel. He says that's the only sign you're going to get. By the way, that's in Revelation too, okay? You're not, you're not going to get any other sign. You're not going to get Jesus coming in the clouds and they're going to be, be able to believe on him. The Jews don't even believe that, but Christians believe that. They believe that the Jews are going to get saved by just simply looking upon Christ. You know, in Revelation chapter 19, when he comes on his white horse. Like, yeah, because they believe, they believe a sign. Yeah, but that's not how you get saved. Yeah, yeah, right. Just because you require a sign, you think that they're requiring, that God is just giving into what they're requiring right. of Him? That's right, amen. It's like, for the rest of the world, it's by faith alone, but my people, the Jews, are requiring a sign, so i got to give them what they're requiring. <laughs> no, God is no respecter of people. Amen. Okay? So it's foolish to think that, what do you call it, that, that, that you need a sign in order to be saved. Okay, and it says that the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, I just got this thought right now, but I, I, I want to backtrack a little bit. I just thought about this, about regarding baptism. Okay, we'll get, we'll get back onto this right now. I, I want to mention this. So, the Church of Christ rejectors, I just thought about this right now. They believe you got to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that those in the wilderness were baptized into Moses, right? They were baptized into Moses by the Red Sea, right? And, and in the cloud, the Bible says. So according to them, those people were saved. Well, what about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Because they, went, they were under the cloud, and they went through the Red Sea. But they split hell wide open. <laughs> Pun intended. Right? So these people were baptized in the cloud and in the Red Sea, but the Bible says that they went quick down into hell. You know? How you like them apples? 
Now go back to verse 22. So for the Jews require, that was a commercial break. The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 21, excuse me. So this puts to bed the simple fact that you're saved by your nationality, right? You have the, the United in Christ, you know, the, I forgot what you call them, the United in Christ believers where it says by your nationality, you know, you're a Vistacar. By the way, I'm a Vistacar according to them or something. What are you? Vistacar? Oh, then I'm not a Vistacar because you're Mexican, right? What? Oh, I'm Zebulun, sorry. So they believe according to your nationality you're saved. No, the Bible says both of these guys got it wrong, yeah. the Jew and the Greek. So it doesn't matter what nationality requires what. God says only by the foolishness of preaching, okay, only by the gospel can you be saved. Now, verse 23 says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. So go to Romans chapter number 9. So he said, basically, yeah, the Jews are requiring a sign of me, and the, Jews, the, the Greeks want wisdom. He goes, I'm just preaching Christ crucified. <laughs> Amen. I'm not going to give what the Jews require, and I'm not going to give what the Greeks require. I'm going to give what God requires, Amen. which is to preach Christ and Him crucified. Now look at Romans 9.32. It says, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. But as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So according to the Bible, the, these Jews who require a sign, they stumbled at Jesus Christ. Yeah. They, stumbled upon, they, they stumbled on him. They didn't want to believe on him, according to the word of God. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. So unto the Jews, a stumbling block, the Bible says, and we see why. You know, he came into his own and his own received them not. May, multiple times they tried to stone him because he made himself uh, like unto God because he is God. Yep. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5. He also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumbled uh, at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Who's that talking about? Let's talk about the Jews again. Yeah. You know, they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Now go to Matthew 21. I want to show you something real quick. Matthew chapter 21. Because this is something that you constantly see, especially in regards to the Jews. You know, the Bible says that they missed their time of visitation. When God in the flesh came to them and, and salvation was born here on this earth, they missed it. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. Now look at Matthew 21, verse 43 says, Therefore say I unto you, verse 43, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, speaking to the Pharisees, which were adherents to Judaism, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but upon whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Now go with me if we went to 2 Chronicles 34. 2 Chronicles chapter 34. I, I read this verse and I was thinking to myself, why does it say that he'll grind them to powder? I mean, maybe he's just illustrating the fact that he's just going to demolish them, which obviously he is, and he has. But why does it say to powder? Like, why does it say that he's just going to grind them to powder? Well, I believe it's because if you read in the Old Testament, specifically in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, you know, you'll read about the bad kings, but you also read about good kings, righteous kings. Yep. And often the first thing that righteous kings would do when they would come into power, what would they do? They would begin to reform the land. Right. They would start coming, break the houses of the Sodomites. You know, they would take down the groves. They would, they would smash all the idols. I mean, they clean house is what they would do. Now, here's an example of this in 2 Chronicles 34 and verse number 5. Speaking of Josiah, which was a very good godly king. Verse number 5 says, And he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even in, uh, unto Naphtali, 
with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graves images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. So what would the righteous king do? When he would come and clean house, he's, he's demolishing everything. He's destroying everything. What does he do? He's grinding it even to powder. I mean, to, to, to kill something and to smash something, it's like, okay, it's done, man. But when you're grinding it to powder, you, I mean, you're making sure that thing will never come to life. That thing can never be put back together. And so it makes sense in Matthew when we read that he says the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And he tells him and elsewhere, no, leaf sh no fruit shall grow on here thereon forevermore. Amen. What is he doing? He's grinding it to powder. Yep. Yeah. Why? Because just as the righteous kings in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles clean house, the king of kings and the Lord of lords will clean house as well. Amen. He's going to grind it to powder. He's right. going to make, make sure Judaism never comes back. That's right. Man. He's like, you're done. <sighs> like the chaff, as the Bible says. The ungodly are taken away like the chaff. So it's not like he's just breaking it down and then you can just build it back up. No, no, no. You can't build that back up ever again. You know, obviously we have people today that are trying to bring back the Hebrew Roots movement. It's not going to work. <laughs> it's already powder. <laughs> it's not going to work. But I thought that was interesting. You know, the Bible says, whosoever shall fall, he shall fall upon, he will grind it to powder. Just like the kings did in the Old Testament. Verse number 24, go back to 1 Corinthians. I'm almost out of time here. Verse number 24. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now, is God foolish? No. What is he saying here? He's saying, if God was foolish, or if he had any, any inkling of any foolishness, even that right. would be greater than the wisdom of men. Yeah. Okay, that's what he's saying. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I love this verse right here. I love these, these, uh, these couple of verses right here. Why? Because he's saying, you know who God uses to, great, great, to do great things to confound the wise? He says he uses, you know, those who are not wise after the flesh. Obviously, we have to be wise according to the Bible, Amen. but not wise according to the flesh. Not those who are mighty. He says, not those who are noble. Yeah. Who are those who are noble? The distinguished, you know, very polished preachers, the graduates of the Bible colleges and the theological cemeteries. I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use those who are not noble. Amen. Those who are a little rough around the edges. Amen. Okay, that's who he's going to use. Why? Because then God gets all the glory. Yeah. He's like... How is God going to use this potty mouth preacher? Well, that's how he's using it. He's using it to see thousands of people saved. Amen. To get a great message across all around the world. That's right. You know, not just him, not just Pastor Anderson. Every, most of the pastors in our movement are like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because we're not mighty. We're not wise. You know, we're not even noble. Right. We've been thrown out of our churches. People have cast out our name as evil. Yeah. People think we're wicked and heretics. God says, I'll use that guy right there. Yeah. You know? To confound the wise. Because God says, I'll use him because if it gets done, they're, not, they're, gonna, they're gonna say it had to be God. <laughs> that guy can't do it. You know, these people in this church can't do it. It's God who, who would have had to have done it. That's why God wants to use people like that. Okay? So don't ever think, well, I can never be used of God because of X, Y, and Z. Well, you know what? That might just qualify you. Right. You know? And you may not get praised and glorified on this world, but God's going to praise you one day. He's going to reward you greatly for that. Amen. And look, the Bible tells us that there's no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few, right? But it goes to show that he wants to use the few in order to see something great done for the Lord. You know, think of Amos, who the Bible says was not a son of a prophet. He was just like a, a herdman. He was nothing, but he did something great for God. Why? Because God doesn't use the noble. He doesn't use the mighty, the wise after the flesh. Verse 28, and base things of the world and things which are despised. I mean, right there. Yeah. What does it mean to be despised? To be hated. Yeah. He's like, I'll take those who are hated. Well, you know what? We're hated. <laughs> You're self-proclaimed being used of God. I'm just saying I'm hated. Yeah. So according to the Bible, he uses those which are despised. God hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not. Look at that. To bring to not the things that are. He says, I'm going to use those who are nobodies 
to make nobodies those who think they are somebodies. You know, he's going to use the nobodies of this world to confound those who are popular amongst independent fundamental Baptist churches. Amen. You know, these false, wicked prophets who are sending a bunch of people to hell, who everyone's afraid of to call out their names. He says, I'm going to use those who are not Amen. to confound those, to, to bring to naught those who think there are something. Okay? Why? Because God wants to use people. God wants to use people who are dependent upon him. Okay, not dependent upon finances, not dependent upon being eloquent. He goes, dependent on my word. Okay. Verse 29, that no flesh, there it is, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Verse 30, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And that's a, that's a reference to Jeremiah 9, verse 24. We won't read that. But, so what's the, what, what is the, the crux of the message here is that, you know what, forget the, the, the wisdom of this world, okay? Amen. We ought to accept the foolishness of, God's pre, of the preaching of the Word of God and just have confidence. Hey, doesn't matter how crazy this may sound, let's just preach it. Amen. Let's just go with what God says. Let's just be on the Lord's side. Let's try to please the Lord. Be not man pleasers. Let's be servants of Christ and depend on Him. And, not, and look, if, you, if you're despised today, okay? By the way, that's a good measure, right? Man. You say, I don't feel good that people don't like me and they say all manner of evil against me. Hey, man, you're despised. Praise the Lord. Man. You know, that's who God uses. You, know, you always wanted to be used of God, right? Well, they're, 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 that's how it starts. You have to be hated. Okay. Right. Amen? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. And we're thankful for the Apostle Paul and the wisdom that you gave him to pen these words, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd help every one of us to take heed. And I think it's easy to uplift the wisdom of this world because sometimes it makes logical sense. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make biblical sense. And I pray you help us to increase our faith in the Word of God as we read it and as we practice it, as we seek to preach it and to give it to others, Lord. And I pray you bless the remainder of our evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.